Uh, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there are uh, paperback ones there against the wall. You can grab one of those and follow along. Uh, or you can go to the Info Hub, as Larry mentioned, uh, info.mdcashville.org, and that'll bring up the passage of Scripture that we're going to be in this morning. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for each of you who call Missio Day Church your home, whether you are a covenant member or not, or maybe somewhere in the process. Uh, as I've reflected on, you know, the, the last 12 years of ministry, uh, I'm just amazed at all that God has done. I mean, so many people have met the Lord here, have taken that step of baptism here. So many people have met their spouse here, uh, had their, started their families here. Uh, we've walked with people through all kinds of darkness and all kinds of joys. And it's just, it just reminds me of how good and how kind and how generous uh, the Lord is. And I am thrilled with you to continue our mission uh, into the next year and beyond of maturing and multiplying disciples, both here in Nashville and beyond, for the glory of God. And I've been dreaming a lot lately, uh, the last couple months in particular, dreaming a lot about the future, dreaming a lot about where God might be taking us uh, over the next several years. And, and, and as I've been doing that, I've been thinking a lot about the kingdom of God. Like, what is the kingdom of God? And how does the kingdom of God come and, and take root here uh, on the earth. In, in the Gospel of Mark, now we're not going to look at this part, but, but right at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, it, it starts with Jesus' words. Some of the Gospels start with Jesus' birth, but Mark, he gets right to the action. And Jesus' first words uh, in the Gospel of Mark um, are this, the time is at hand, right? The time is now. I, I have come uh, to, to, to bring the kingdom. This is... Um, I didn't write the passage down. It's in the beginning of uh, Mark chapter 1. Anyway, he says, I've come bringing the kingdom, right? right? The time is at hand. Uh, it's, the kingdom of God is, is manifesting on the earth. Repent and believe the gospel. He's saying, I'm bringing the kingdom of God. I'm bringing it to the earth. What does that mean? What, like, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is nothing less than the power and the presence of the God of heaven taking hold on the earth. And when that happens, sin is forgiven. Brokenness is restored. Injustice is righted. Mourning and crying and pain give way to rejoicing and laughter and healing in the name of Jesus. And that's our hope. That is our hope here at Missio Day Church, that the kingdom of God would come, that God's will would be done in Asheville as it is in heaven, that people would worship Jesus, that they would surrender themselves to Jesus, that they would depend upon Jesus, and as they do so, they would find forgiveness, they would find healing, they would find restoration, and they would find freedom as the power of the gospel is unleashed in their lives. That they would grow to the fullness of maturity in Christ. And as that happens, it would multiply out from them so that we would see more disciples made, more ministries started, more churches planted so that families and communities all throughout what we call the 828 area code would be radically transformed by Jesus. So the question before us is, how does that happen? Like, how does the gospel of Jesus Christ unleash its power in our lives? And that's what we're going to look at this morning in Mark chapter 4. So um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first 20 verses. So we're going to try to cover 20 verses this morning, uh, and then I'll pray for us and we'll dive in here. But I just want you to hear it uh, as I read it so you can get a sense of the flow of the passage. Mark chapter 4 starting in verse 1, says this. Again, he, that being Jesus, began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him <clears throat> so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, 
where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. So that they may indeed see but not perceive, and that they may hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then are you to understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. Uh, the one who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful. Grateful for your faithfulness to us over the last 12 years of ministry here. Grateful that you have rescued us from sin and death and called us your children because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So Lord, we celebrate today your faithfulness to us, undeserving people who have enjoyed your blessings, who have enjoyed your love and your acceptance and you making us fruitful in this city. And we give you great praise and honor and thanks for that. Lord, we want to take this time to pray for the people of the Bahamas, the people of Eastern North Carolina, and all those who have been so devastated by this hurricane. Lord, would you meet the needs of these men and women through your people? Would hope and healing and aid come to them? And would the gospel, which has transformed us, Go out and transform them as well. But Lord, we plead with you to bring help and hope and healing to those who are devastated and hurting this morning. Lord, as we look into your word now, a very familiar passage, a very familiar parable, may you give us maybe fresh ears to hear this. Let us not make assumptions, but to hear it as if it was for the first time. And and may we wrestle with this, and may we apply this scripture to our lives so that we might be transformed. We love you, we thank you, we praise you in the name of Jesus, the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. All right, so this is a familiar parable. You guys have heard this before, I'm sure. It's actually, um, it's such an important parable. It's recorded in three of the four gospels. So you'll find this same story in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. And so sometimes that familiarity that we have with a passage of scripture like this leads us sort of to, to contempt, right? Like we, we know it, we understand it. Uh, oh, this passage again, and and we don't really listen to it. So I I do want you to listen uh, with some fresh ears. Jesus is in the early stages of his ministry, okay? He has has sort of just begun uh, his public ministry. And Luke says in his gospel account that Jesus is proclaiming and bringing the kingdom of God to every city and town in which he visits, which means that Jesus is healing diseases, that Jesus is liberating those oppressed by uh, demons and, and unclean spirits, and And most importantly, that he's preaching the good news, that he's preaching the gospel of God's kingdom. And as he does so, 
These huge crowds are gathering. Jesus can't go anywhere without a massive crowd of people sort of pressing in on him. And so in this text, he gets into a boat to sort of push away from the, from the shore so that he can address all the people and that they don't crush him. They don't press in on him so much. You got you to understand, there are all kinds of people in these crowds. There are true believers in this crowd. Those who have surrendered themselves to Jesus and are following him wholeheartedly. There are unbelievers in this crowd. Those who don't, they don't believe anything that Jesus is saying. They don't believe anything that he's doing. There are doubters. There are skeptics. And there's some of those who are just there for the show. They're just there to see what miracle Jesus will perform or what healing he will do. And so Jesus, a master teacher, he starts to teach in a parable. Now, a parable, just briefly, is a story drawn from common experience which is meant to convey truth kind of in an indirect way. So he, he tells this parable, and it's very simple, about a farmer who's planting seed. Now, one thing you might need to know is that uh, back in this time, uh, you did not first plow your field and then plant your seed. You actually did the opposite. You just threw the seed wherever, and then you would come back later and plow it and, and sort of work it into the ground. And so here's this farmer and, uh, and he's got a bunch of seed, and usually they would have, it's, you know, it'd kind of be like a messenger bag, okay, you throw over your shoulder, and it'd be full of seed, and they would just start throwing the seed out wherever, okay? And the wind, if there was any wind, it would kind of catch that seed, and it would blow. And, and it, it, you know, wherever the wind took it, it would land, and so some of it would fall on the walking path, that hard-packed ground, and it would just sit there, and the birds would kind of take it away. And some of that seed, as he threw it, would, would fall uh, sort of... Um, uh, on, on the edges of the field, okay? Some of it would, would uh, land on, on ground where there was uh, limestone underneath. And so you couldn't tell from, the, from you know, ab- above, but underneath there was rock there, limestone, so that if it started to take root, it would just hit the rock and it couldn't grow any further. Some that landed on the edges of the field where there, other things were growing, it was a bunch of weeds and a bunch of thorns. And then some you would throw out and it would land actually on good soil. And and as Jesus says, it would take root and it would grow and it would multiply and there'd be all kinds of great crops. So Jesus tells this very simple story and he says, the end. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you understand what I mean by this, Jesus says? And that's it, end of church, (laughs) right? Crowd disperses. And the disciples and some others come up to him after and they go, no, Jesus, we don't understand. It's funny, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, he actually says that the disciples come to Jesus and they say, why do you speak in parables? <laughs> They're like, why are you so confusing, Jesus? Why don't you just say what you mean? And so Jesus is going to explain this parable to them. But before he does so, he says something that we can take as very troubling. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. He said to them, to you, to his disciples, has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. He's quoting Isaiah 6 here. The question is, what? 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 Jesus, a basic rule of public speaking is that you want people to be able to understand what you're saying. Like, that's just common sense, right? Like, if I got up here and just started sharing with you crazy random stories that didn't really make a lot of sense, it sounded like I was quoting the B-52s or Beck or, you know, Chance the Rapper or something, I'm like, all right, that's the end of church, we're done. And you're like, what in the, I don't understand. That's what's happening. So what? What is Jesus doing? Well, we assume, we often assume that parables were given to clarify some challenging point of doctrine that Jesus was wanting us to understand. And that's, that's partially true. But Jesus says that these parables actually serve a dual purpose. They are to, to reveal certain things to some, But the parables, he says, are also given to conceal things from others. In other words, the parables act like a filter. 
They act like a filter. Here's what I mean. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he is surrounded by all kinds of people who want what he can give them without actually wanting him. Like, I know we've grown and matured a lot over the centuries, and those kind of people don't exist anymore, but there were people back then, way back then, who wanted what Jesus could give them. They wanted healing. They wanted restoration. They wanted forgiveness. They wanted a, a, a chance at a new life, but they didn't actually want Jesus. They didn't actually love Jesus. And Jesus says, I don't just want to be followed. I don't just want to be understood. I want to be loved. I want to be trusted. And so to those who don't really want him, his message, his parable goes in one ear and out the other. But to those, he says, who have ears to hear, they come back. Did you see how few people stayed behind? <laughs> Jesus finished his story. He dismissed church and everybody left. But there were some who were like, whoa, 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 whoa. What does that mean? Tell us what this means. Everyone else is like, hey, can we get back to the blessing and the healing and the feeding? Can we get, let's get back to that stuff. Let's not worry about your teaching later. But there were a few who said, we want to know. We want to understand. Where do you find yourself this morning? Are you following Jesus because you want Jesus? Or are you following Jesus because you want what he can give you? It's a very different motives. Very different motives. And so Jesus is going to now explain this story to his disciples. Y'all with me? So quiet. It's a happy day. Like, let's get involved. All right. Uh... So verse 13, look at verse 13. He, and he said to them, do you not parable? Of course, they said, no. And so he said, well, how are you going to understand all the parables? Let me explain it to you. The sower sows the word. I'm going to keep going here. And these are the ones along the path where, this, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that's sown in them. And these are the ones that are sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy but they have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Let's just stop there. So to clarify, Jesus says in this parable, in this story, the seed represents the word, meaning his teaching, his gospel. And the soil, the, the ground, the field is, is the, the human heart. Now, why does he compare the gospel to a seed. You ever think about that? Of all the metaphors Jesus could have used, why would he use a seed when explaining his word, the gospel? Well, you realize that seeds have an incredible power to them. So you should have gotten a little packet of seeds when you walked in that came with your weekly. And one of the reasons I wanted to give these out, um, we're going to talk about them a little bit later, but if you kind of shake that package you'll feel that there's like little tiny things in there, right? These are super tiny little, little seeds, and yet they have incredible power in them. For instance, um, if I was to take this dime and bury it in the ground and water it and fertilize it, you know what I'd have? A dime, <laughs> a dirty dime, okay? Uh, I can save you a lot of trouble. No money trees will spring up, okay? You're just gonna have a dime. But similar size, I got this acorn out of my backyard, okay? I got an oak tree in my backyard and a little metal roof on the patio and tum, 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 I can't hear it all the time. They are the same size. If I was to bury this acorn into the ground and water it and fertilize it, what would come out of this is a mighty oak tree. And not only would a mighty oak tree come out of it, but hundreds, maybe thousands over the course of that tree's life, more acorns would come from that tree. And out of those acorns might come more trees. And out of those trees, more acorns and more trees. In other words, in this one acorn is the power to cover the entire earth with oak trees. Isn't that incredible? And yet, 
It's such a tiny, little, vulnerable, helpless thing that I could crush with, between my fingers if I wanted to. Seeds, there, there's almost nothing, like you think about the seeds you got in this packet, if you were to, to sow these seeds, there's almost nothing gentler. Like you could even throw the seed down and it's not gonna make a dent in the ground, right? But when you sow seed, there's almost nothing, you just, you just drop it, you just lay it down. Seeds do not smash the earth like a boulder. They don't make an imprint. You don't need a pickaxe. You don't need dynamite to plant seeds. You just drop them. And as you drop them, over time, they sort of settle their way in, work their way in gradually into the soil and, and things spring up. Well, the gospel has an incredible power to it. Paul in the book of Romans says that the gospel is the power. Not that it has power, but it is the power of salvation to those who believe. There's this incredible power to the gospel. And the life and the power of God is released in us through the gospel like a seed. In, in the book of uh, 1 Peter, for instance, um, Peter talks about how the gospel comes to us. And if I can find it, I just want to read you this one little, uh, little passage out of 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, you have been born again. This is 1 Peter 1, 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So he says, the word of God, the gospel has come to you like a seed and it's an imperishable seed and it is blossomed in you. It's released its power in you and you have changed. See, the gospel comes to us, the word comes to us, not externally to conform us, but internally. It, it, it takes root in us and it starts to transform us from the inside out. Organically and gradually and gently. So for instance, your whole life, you are working to make up for the mistakes that you have made. You are trying harder to do better. You are, you are trying to make sure that you follow all the rules because you know you broke some in the past. And, and over time, the gospel, the seed of the gospel gets planted in you and it starts to do its work in you. And all of a sudden, you start to realize that in Christ, you are forgiven. Past, present, and future, completely forgiven. That when Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, he meant it is finished. Not part one is done, but you got to keep up with the... No, it is finished. So you start to embrace the idea that you have been forgiven. Not only that, okay, uh, as the gospel, the seed of the gospel starts to work in you over time, because I know that for most people, this doesn't happen instantaneously, you start to realize over the course of time that not only have you been forgiven of sin, all sin, past, present, and future, but that you have been credited with the righteousness of God. Meaning, you, there is nothing that you have to do to keep yourself in God's grace. There's nothing that you have to do to earn his acceptance or approval, but because you have been credited with the righteousness of God in Christ, when God looks at you, he does not see your sin, your flaws, your failures. He sees the perfect spotless righteousness of Jesus himself, and he, and he says, that is beautiful. See, it takes time for that to work itself into our, into our souls, doesn't it? Maybe over time you start to realize, you know, I, I have been my whole life trying to earn the acceptance of other people, to earn their approval, to earn their acceptance. And I try to be a really nice person. I try to be a really successful person. I try to do all these things so that other people will look at me and say, I want to be your friend. I want to hang around you. I want to spend time with you. And then you start to realize that in Jesus, because of Jesus, the only acceptance that you really ever need, you already have. And you can work from God's acceptance and not for other people's acceptance. Maybe over time you start to realize just how incredibly loved you are by the Father. 
that he doesn't just accept you, but he loves you. That, that you are loved by God with the same kind of love that he loves Jesus himself. And that God's love for you cannot increase or decrease based on how well or how badly you are doing. But his love for you is full and final and complete because of Jesus. Do you see what I'm saying? Like how the gospel, how the seed of the gospel starts to unleash its power in you and bring you freedom. But it has to go deep. And that's the problem that we find in some of these other soil samples that Jesus speaks of. So in verse 15, he says, these are the ones along the path where the seed is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that's sown in them. In other words, these are people whose hearts are so hardened that they won't even receive the word. They won't even receive the gospel. They don't want to hear it. They don't want anything to do with it. And there's no life in them and there can't be any life in them because the seed never penetrates the soil. I remember a couple years ago when, when I'm, uh, it was about seven years ago, moved in our house and they had this big overgrown tree that I cut down and in the backyard there was just this big circle of dead, uh, of just dirt because that tree had overgrown so much that there wasn't any where, where for the grass to grow. So I started reseeding and I had never done this before. So what I do, I just threw the grass seed on the ground and you know what happened? In a couple of weeks, I still had a big dirt pile, all right? Just still had a big circle of dirt because that seed, the, the ground was so hard, the seed just sat there and it couldn't germinate because it didn't go under the ground. So I had to go back and use a rake and whatever and kind of dig it up and make that seed bury into the ground and, and now there's grass there. It's the same with our hearts. These are people who can understand the gospel. They can understand the, the teaching of Jesus on an intellectual level, but it has never pierced their souls. Their heart is resistant. Is that you this morning? That you hear it, you understand it, but you don't believe it. That it hasn't actually done anything in you, inside of you. You can have all, you can be in regular contact with the word of God. Like you can sit in church week after week. You can read the Bible and it never actually penetrate your soul because your heart is so hard. You can actually have right doctrine. You can believe the right things about God in your head, but it never actually transformed your heart. That's what James 2 says. It's frightening. Oh, so you believe that Jesus is God? Great. So do the demons. They believe that, but they don't love him. They've not been transformed. The truth of that has never pierced their souls. And we know people like this, don't we? We know people who are just so hardened that, that they're, they're wonderful people and you love them and you spend time with them, but anytime anything spiritual gets brought up, anything about Jesus gets brought up, gets brought up no, don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me about that. They, they are so hardened to it that they have no desire to hear it. And then he goes on, the, the next soil, verse 16. I'm getting somewhere with this, by the way, okay? Just bear with me. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. They have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. And then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. These are people, the ones that the seed falls on rocky ground are people with shallow hearts. Shallow hearts so that the seed can't actually go deep enough to take firm root. This is a scary one for me. Because there are people who seem to respond positively to the word, right? Whether it's they're hearing it for the first time or maybe, you know, they're hearing it in a new light and they're going, oh, this is amazing. I never, I never thought about it this way before. And they start to embrace the word. They start to embrace the gospel with joy. They seem like they're all in, okay? They get excited about it. They're, they're, you're starting to see changes in their lives. Like they're, they're, you know, changing their lifestyle. They're reading the Bible. They're signing up for community group. They're signing up for serve team. They're just excited to be here. They're here early every Sunday. They leave late. They want to be around God's people. And then something happens. They lose their job. The relationship dissolves. They get in a car wreck. They get sick. Something happens in their lives and all of a sudden, they're gone. They're out. You're going, wait, what happened? You were, 
You were all in. You, you were excited about this thing. You were growing. But as soon as Jesus says, as soon as the heat comes, right? When the sun comes, the, the heat scorches because there's no root in them. As soon as hardship comes, as soon as suffering comes into their lives, they walk away from Jesus. Now look, many people come to Jesus because of problems in their lives, and that's okay. Like, he can help us. That's not a bad thing, but, but when we come to Jesus for relief, and when we don't experience the relief we think we need, we bounce. But let me tell you, if this, is, if this is you, or if you know people like this, let me just remind you that what you need more than relief is redemption. What you need more... Not saying that God won't or can't bring relief to you, but more than relief, you need actual redemption. And so many people, they come to Jesus for relief, and when they don't get the relief that they need, they walk away. And all it does is prove that they were coming, they were seeing Jesus as a means to another end rather than the means, the end himself. He just existed to serve my greater. My real God is over there, and I just thought Jesus could get me to keep, help me keep my real God. But, my, but when my real God is the thing that burns away in the heat, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. Some of you know people like this. Listen, listen, in 12 years of ministry, I've seen every one of these stories, right? I mean, I've seen people so hardened that they don't have any room to hear it. I've seen these people who respond and you think, man, this is amazing. They're, they're going to really follow. And then within a month, two months, six months, they're out. Charles Spurgeon once put it this way. He said, we, we do ourselves in the gospel a disservice when we certify in a half a minute what takes the testing of a lifetime. We get focused on decisions for Jesus rather than watching the fruit of a life that follows Jesus. We're in trouble. Okay. Now, still hanging? Okay. <laughs> Verse 18. Look at... He's going to keep going, okay? Here's one more soil sample. The others are the ones sown among thorns. And they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word, and it proves unfruitful. The problem with this one is that everybody thinks it's about somebody else. These are... Not people with hard hearts, not people with shallow hearts, but people with divided hearts. And the seed still doesn't go deep enough. So see, look, the gospel comes in. It actually does take root in these people's hearts and in their lives. But their heart is divided between loyalty to Jesus and what Jesus says are the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and then he just category, he does he put junk drawer and other things. <laughs> I love that. And other things. Because there's not a single one of us in this room who don't at some point in our lives have divided loyalty between Jesus and other things. It's a heart divide. They're miserable. These first two groups, I think it's clear from the text, <clears throat> and those first two groups are not actually genuine Christians, right? There's no fruit at all. There's no proof, no evidence that they actually came into relationship with God at all. They just maybe, the, the second group maybe appeared to, but, but didn't because it, it didn't last. But this third group, they might be, it's hard to tell, but they might be genuine believers, but their heart is so divided that there's no fruitfulness in them and they're miserable because they can't walk away. The other two groups, they just abandon, they walk away. But these folks, they can't walk away. They know too much. <laughs> They've seen too much. They can't walk away. They can't go back, but they're not going forward either. They're stagnant. They aren't growing. They aren't changing. The real power of God is not being unleashed or flowing in their lives, and they're stuck, and they're miserable. Because their, their desire for other things... Now listen, they could be good things. It could be your family. It could be your job. It could be serving in the ministry. That these other desires, these other things that you're holding on to are competing with your loyalty to Jesus and it's choking out actual fruitfulness in your life and you're miserable. You're anxious. You're angry. You're sad. Because your heart is divided. 
Now at this point, some of you might be going, this is really a discouraging message for a birthday sermon. Like three of the four soils rejected the seed. What is this about? Oh, look, look, look. Verse 20. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and what? Bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. You know how insane that is? Like one, now I don't know much about farming or agriculture or planting anything. Uh, we'll know a little bit about planting churches, but you, one seed, one seed that actually takes root 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. This is a miraculous fruit from this plant, from this seed, right? This is in- incredible. And as we saw in the Abide series just a couple weeks ago, fruit is not just growth in our character, but it's the advancement of the kingdom of God as well. Fruitfulness. Where there is fertile ground, there will be fruit. So the good soil, Jesus says, are people with a transformed heart. People with a transformed heart. Now, this parable is so important, as I mentioned earlier, that it's recorded in two other Gospels. And in Luke's, he says this about, about this person with a transformed heart. He says, the, uh, the good soil is the person who, upon hearing the word, holds it fast with an honest and good heart. Now, that's a problem, because who has an honest and a good heart? (laughs) Nobody. Nobody. Our hearts have to be made capable of receiving that seed, don't they? In other words, the only way that the soil of our hearts is made capable of receiving the seed so that it can bear fruit has got to be the work of the divine gardener. He alone can till up the hardness of hearts. And I have seen it happen, brothers and sisters, and you have too. Hearts that seem so hardened to the gospel, so far away. People who are so angry at the world and angry at God, they wanted nothing to do with him or his people. And over the course of time, the divine gardener just got his tiller out and just started tearing away at it. And as the gospel seed got planted, all of a sudden it found its way in and they were like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, I think I'm in, right? You've seen this. I hope you have. He can till up the hardness of hearts. He can remove the stones out of the soil so that the roots can go down deep. He can weed out the thorns. Now that's not the stuff we enjoy. Remember in Abide, we talked about pruning. Having those thorns ripped out is not fun because it's stuff we like, that we like too much, and he pulls it back. Here's where I take encouragement. This is kind of where I'm going with, with our future here, okay? In Luke's gospel, in chapter 10, so again, there's, this is stories happens in multiple gospels, but in Luke's gospel, and I hope you'll follow me here, uh, Jesus is, he's got some disciples and he's starting to send them out. And he's sending them out to other towns and villages ahead of where he's going to go. And he sends them out two by two. So he's sending his people out to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the good news. He's sending them. And as he sends them, he says in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send out more laborers into the harvest. Do you catch what he's saying here? Now, connect these two similar metaphors, okay? The seed of the gospel is getting thrown out everywhere. Sometimes it's going to land on the path, on hard soil, and those people are not going to embrace it. Sometimes it's going to get thrown out into soil that's got rocks underneath it. So it's going to grow a little bit, and it's going to hit that, and it's going to kind of look like it's something, and it's nothing. And then you're going to see some seed that goes out, and it's on the edge, and there's thorns and thistles and all this overgrowth that comes, and it sort of chokes out the fruitfulness. But then... There's some other seed that it lands in that fertile soil and it starts to grow and take root and it's 30, 60, 100 fold. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. Plentiful. That means a lot. 
That means that regardless of the fact that these other three soil samples don't really take root, there's one that does. Yes, some people are going to scoff and reject. Yes, some people are going to embrace for a season and ultimately abandon. Yes, some people are going to embrace the gospel but refuse to let go of this world. But many are going to receive it and they're going to bear fruit. There are many, I believe still, that in a city even like ours, which is so dark in so many ways and so hardened in so many ways and so apathetic in so many ways, that there, are still, there is still a plentiful harvest of people who are going to see that Jesus is the Word made flesh who became a seed. He came like a seed, not in power, but in weakness. They're going to see that Jesus came to live a life that they could never live. A life of complete fidelity to God, a a life of complete holiness, a life of complete perfection, and he did it because they never could. They're going to see that Jesus came to die and be buried. Why? Because seeds only release their power when they're buried and die. That's what Jesus tells us in John chapter 12. Unless a seed is buried and dies, it cannot bear fruit. He came to be the seed that dies and is buried. He came to rise again from the dead to conquer our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell so that the power of God could be released in them. And they're going to worship Jesus with their whole hearts and they're going to surrender everything to Jesus and they're going to depend on Jesus as if their very life was at stake. And they're going to find forgiveness and they're going to find healing and they're going to find restoration and they're going to find freedom in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, the harvest is still plentiful. But the laborers are few. So as we go forward into the next year, two years, five years, however long, My question to you is this, will you receive this word? Will you receive the seed of the gospel? Some of you, you are believers right now, but your hearts are hard. Your hearts are hard. Some of you aren't believers and and today you need to repent. You need to turn away from yourself and, and embrace Jesus and let him do his work in you. Some of you, you have shallow hearts. There's all kind of rocks and stuff down in there and you're not seeing. Some of you have divided hearts. You just got too many things that are competing for your affection and your attention. Will you receive the word? Will you worship Christ alone? Will you surrender to Christ alone? Will you depend on Christ alone? But then for the rest of us, for all of us, really, will we labor? Will we labor? Like, I want each of you to mature. That's our first thing, right? Maturing and multiplying. I want you all to grow in your understanding of the gospel and your relationship with God. And I want your character to grow. And I want you to to be involved in know people here, have uh, brothers and sisters. This is what you need, community. We're going to have those tents out there. And if you're not in a group, we want you to join a group so that you can grow in community. We want you to be active in serving this body and in having a sense of contribution. But Part of maturity, like as you grow to maturity, you start to understand that this thing isn't for you. It's not about you. It's not for you. But it's for those who aren't yet in relationship with God. It's for those who are outside of the walls of this place. And so we want to see it multiply. We want to see disciples multiply. We want to see churches multiply. Like what would it, what would it look like if we became if we embraced this idea that we are just a bunch of nobodies who want to tell anybody about the somebody who wants to save everybody. What, what if, what if, what if we embrace the idea that, that the next generation, our students and our children, desperately need the gospel? And we are willing to do whatever it takes in order to help them see and believe and understand the gospel 
at their level and to grow as disciples of Jesus. Because, you know, we, we walked through the book of Joshua, didn't we? And we saw the end of Joshua and how he says, choose you this day who you'll follow. And then we looked at the book of Judges just a couple chapters later where it said, there arose a generation who did not know the Lord. That cannot be on our watch, brothers and sisters. It cannot happen on our watch. What would it look like if we saw ourselves as sent into our own neighborhoods, workplaces, relationships, gyms, coffee shops, and into this neighborhood where God has given us a footprint with the hope of the gospel in word and in deed? What what would it look like to to reach out to the people who come to this very building every single week in recovery ministries and to just have a reach into them and to tell them the hope of Jesus and how he ultimately brings healing? What would it look like to reach into the the, the, uh, hospitality and food service industry in this city, which is so prevalent and is so dark and so far from Christ? What would it look like to, to, to see new churches planted in the rest of the counties that make up the A2A. You've heard me say this at nauseum, but our, our vision is to, to see a church planted, replanted, and they're strengthened in every one of the 22 counties that make up the A2A. And God has allowed us to, to help plant in Transylvania County and in Burke County and, and in uh, Mitchell County now, and, and more stuff is coming. But brothers and sisters, like this, it's our turn. It's our time to mature, to grow, to become good soil so that the gospel takes root in our lives and to see it multiplied out of us so that people outside these walls who are far, far, far from Jesus might have a chance at knowing him, trusting him, believing in him, and growing in him as well. It's where I want to go. It's where I think the Lord wants us to go, and I'm, I want you to go with me. <laughs> it's going to be a wild ride, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. So as we close out, I'm going to have some questions on the screen for you and then I'm going to come back to this little packet here. So you can write these down if you want as they come or you can take a picture of the screen when they're all up. First question is this. What is the condition of the soil of my heart? As you just evaluate yourself this morning, is your heart hard? Is your heart shallow? Is your heart divided? Or is there good soil there where the gospel is actually taking root and starting to grow? Secondly, what's preventing me from growing and bearing fruit? So depending on how you answered question number one, what's getting in the way of growth and maturity and fruit being born out of your own life? Growth in your character and growth out of who you are in, in the sense of more disciples being made. What's preventing me from growing and bearing fruit in my own life? Third, how might the Lord empower my labor for the kingdom of God? In other words, what role can I play? As I think about the idea of, of scattering seed, right? Every single one of us, not just the professional Christian up here with the Bible open, but all of us are called to be seed scatterers, to proclaim in word and deed the hope of the gospel. What role might I play? What, how can I labor? What, what would he have me do to participate in the expansion of the kingdom of God. And then last, where do I see the divine gardener at work, both in my life and in the lives of others? What's he already doing? Maybe you have friends, neighbors, coworkers who are in a rough patch or who are struggling, who are open to the things of God that might be an opportunity that the gardener is tilling up the soil and now's the time. So here's, here's the thing. I don't care what you do with this, but here's the two thoughts that I had with this. Number one is that this is a reminder to you. You can make it a bookmark. It's a reminder of how you're receiving the gospel, how you're receiving the word of God. How, what's the condition of my soil as the seed of God's word comes to me? And secondly, who needs these seeds, right? Who out there, who in my sphere of influence needs the seed of the gospel scattered and let, let, let God do with it what he will, right? It's, it's on us to scatter that seed and let God do with it what he will.
So maybe you find that cheesy. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't care. I thought it'd be fun. All right. Let me pray for you and I'm going to invite you to respond to the Lord.